Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Charles Johnson. I'm the Group Technical Director for a company called CAS. Uh, now, CAS is a management consultancy that works in a range of sectors uh, and delivers a range of services. We cover things like asset management, obviously, uh, but we also work in health and safety, uh, due diligence and areas of that sort, including human factors. And we work in areas like competence management systems, uh, psychometrics, and a whole range of other areas. We have offices in London and in Beijing, and we're also a part of a group called the Intelligent Thinking Alliance. Now, having said that we do all of these sorts of work, the one concept that holds together all the work that we do with organizations is the idea of organizational competence. And we see organizational competence as a way of helping companies to ensure that they actually get maximum value from the resources that they have available to them. So the purpose of my talk today is to try to very briefly talk about our philosophy of organizational competence, how we think it works, and how it applies to asset management organizations. Now, when I talk to people about uh, competence, most organizations jump immediately to the concept of individual competence. Now, individual competence is definitely necessary to the successful functioning of an organization, but it doesn't operate on its own. So part of what I'm going to need to do today is I'm going to talk about how some of the other major influences affect whether you are or are not a competent organization. And that includes things like organizational structure, leadership, the quality of leadership, the nature of the culture that you have in your organization, and the quality of the management that's available to you. But I'm going to start first with individual competence and talk about what it is that you need to have in place to make sure that individuals do indeed have the competence that they need to make your company successful. Now the first thing is that you really, really need to have some explicit and clear requirements in place which describe what the total set of competences are that an organization needs to do its work. There are various ways of doing that. The Institute of Asset Management, for example, has a, a high-level competence framework which describes the whole range of asset management activities that an organization might be involved in. Now, it's not the case that every organization has a requirement for all of those areas of competence. And it's particularly not the case that any one individual needs to have all of those areas of competence. That will depend on the role, it will depend on the nature of the work. Even at an organisational level, it will depend on uh, whether you, uh, asset management is central to what you're doing or whether it's just a support function. So, for example, if you are the responsible body for a national piece of infrastructure, like transport infrastructure or something of that sort, then it's pretty clear that you're likely to have to cover all the areas of asset management. If, however, you're, say, a delivery company where your only real asset is your fleet of vehicles, then your interest in asset management might be much more limited. And therefore, the range of competences that an individual has will be much more limited. Nonetheless, what you should be doing, and this is the key thing about it, is that when you are working your competence management system, you should be very, very clear that everything that you do is geared towards the organization fulfilling all its competence needs. So recruitment and selection, training, development, uh, managing performance and all of those sorts of parts of the process should all be geared towards meeting the overall requirements. And one of the key tests that we would apply when we're looking at an organization is that when we look at the competences that are held by all, by all the individuals who are in that organization, when you aggregate them, add them all together, do they add up to the full set of competences that the organization needs? And more importantly, is there also a plan in place for ensuring that you continue in the future to meet those requirements? So that would be one of our key tests, uh, looking at whether an organization is competent or not. 
Now, as I say, that's only part of the story. And the other four major areas that I want to look at all influence whether or not an organisation behaves or performs in a competent way. Uh, there are lots of examples of companies who have got plenty of qualified, competent individuals, but because of the way that they're organised, or because of the way that the organisation is structured, they simply don't perform up to the top of their ability. So, some of the key things about organisational structure are that two things. Uh, the first one is, where are your asset managers within the organisation? And the second thing is about whether they're grouped together in teams that actually make sense and are capable of performing effectively. So if you think about structure, think about what happens in a typical bureaucratic hierarchical organisation. If the most senior asset management person in your organisation is right at the top of your organisational tree, that person obviously is in a position to influence all other parts of the organisation. They have the power to make things happen. They have good routes of communication right down through the organisation. And they are in a position to have good line of sight from the top of the organisation right down to the front line and back up again. However, if your most senior asset management person is somewhere, say, on the third tier of management, then there becomes an issue about how much they can actually influence people in other parts of the organisation, how good is their communication links to those people, do they have proper line of sight to what other parts of the organisation are doing, and more importantly, in some cases, do they have good line of sight to what's happening above them in the organisation. And, uh, and if that person is not in a position to exert the right sort of influence, then that's going to affect whether asset management is properly embedded in your company or not. Now, as I say, that's one part of it. The other part is about the way in which you put together teams. Asset management teams are often made up of people who come from all sorts of different disciplines. There may be engineers, technicians, uh, finance people and so on, strategists, planners, all sorts of people might be part of your asset management team. So there are things that you need to think about there, which is that is the personality mix of that team right for the team to function properly? Are they co-located in the same geographical locations? Because if you have people who are supposed to be part of a team who are all working in different places, the chances of you having an effective team is very low. And indeed, I came across a company quite recently who made the decision that one of the reasons why they weren't working effectively, this was a utility company, was that they had their different functions all in different buildings. They were trying to put together asset management teams, and of course, it didn't work. So again, a question that we would always ask looking at an organization, trying to decide whether it's a competent organization, is, is the structure of the organization appropriate for the type of organisation it is, and will it actually help individuals within that organisation work effectively? The next uh, major issue is about the quality of leadership in the, in the company. Now, leaders obviously have a huge impact on all sorts of things, particularly on the culture and the values uh, and the attitudes of the organisation. So there are certain sorts of things that we would always look for in leaders, and this doesn't matter whether it's asset management or not. There are certain sorts of things we'd look for. We look for leaders who have vision, who have a really good idea of where the company is going and where they want it to go. Uh, we look at the sort of uh, leadership styles that they adopt, and we recognise that one of the key things about good leaders is that they're capable of adapting their style to meet different circumstances. Leaders also need to show that they are capable of being accountable. Uh, they need to be decisive because they're the people who have to make difficult decisions in the face of insufficient information and uncertainty. So they need to show that they can do those sorts of things. They need to also be able to inspire their colleagues in the information, in the organization and at other levels in the organization. And possibly most importantly of all, they have to engender trust in their fellow staff members. 
that if you have leaders who are not trusted, the chances of you having a good working culture within the organization is very, very low. Now, leaders are not the only people who influence culture because there are all sorts of influences. Um, but nonetheless, there are certain things that we're looking for in the culture of an organization which tell us whether it's likely to be successful or not. Now, the first thing is, is, is the culture that you have appropriate to the purpose and goals of the organizations? And is that culture actually being managed? Because one of the problems that often arises in organizations is that the culture just grows organically. And that's actually no use because that's a way of developing subcultures which are counterproductive of having conflicts within the organization because these things will just grow up and they will tend to grow up around those people who have power and influence. So the sorts of questions that you need to be asking yourself is that do we have common aspirations towards what sort of organization we want to be, how we want to behave, how we do things around here. That's the, the absolutely key question. And as part of that, there also needs to therefore be very clear expectations of what the right sort of behavior looks like and how you can tell if it's being effective or not. As an example of one of the problems that can arise when senior managers start thinking about the type of culture that they want, is that they often demonstrate a degree of wishful thinking which is very unhealthy. Uh, a very common one is to say that what I want to have is an innovative organization. And the trouble is that they don't take into account the various constraints that they're under when they're making that statement. So for example, if you are working in a highly regulated industry, the chances of you actually being able to be as innovative as you would like to be is very slim. So there's always a balance here to be achieved between the reality of the situation and what you would like to aspire to. Um, and you have to be careful about not giving mixed messages to your staff. You don't want to be saying things like, I want you to take responsibility for your own work, be as innovative as possible, but whatever you do, you must follow procedures to the letter because that's just going to cause uh, confusion among staff and it's bound to affect the quality of the work that you're doing. Now, one of the other things about that is that it's not the case that there is any such thing as the best asset management culture. The culture that is best for you as an organization will depend entirely on the type of organization that you are, the sorts of things that you do, the operations that you're involved in, and things like that. M more to the point, it is not the case that there's even one best culture for that one organization. There is a place within organizations to have effective subcultures, and that's almost inevitably going to happen because different parts of the organization have different goals, different needs, work in different environments. There is no reason why the, uh, say, the marketing department should have exactly the same culture as the maintenance department. They'd like to have different constraints on them and all that sort of thing. But what's really important about this, and when we're talking about managing culture, what you really have to aim at is making sure that everybody in the organization understands what the overall goals, the overall purpose of the organizations are, what those aspirations are, and how they contribute to achieving that purpose and goals. So they can operate in different ways as long as they're all clear about where they're going. The problems arise when you get subcultures who are in conflict with each other. And then you start getting all the problems that you will recognize about having people working in silos, where people hide away information, where they are uh, at war about trying to get the resources that they need, and things of that sort. So there's a, an important balance to be maintained there between making sure that you have effective subcultures within the organization um, and that they're not being counterproductive or toxic. Now, individual managers play a huge part in making that work. There's a big distinction between manage management and leadership, which is not often made. They're often confused. 
And I don't mean by that that leaders can't be managers or that managers can't be leaders. But the, the, the core idea is that leadership is about looking to the future and making sure the organization is going in the right direction. What management is about is making sure that on a day-to-day -day basis the company is being effective, that its work is properly organized, uh, that you're being efficient, that you're meeting your budgetary targets and things of that sort. But managers, because they're close to staff and because they're affecting how they work all the time, are absolutely key in producing the right culture within the organization. And there are kind of four main ways in which managers influence culture uh, and therefore organizational competence. The first one is about their ability to motivate and incentivize staff. Uh, there are various ways that they can do that. There are tangible benefits they can give to people, which includes things like pay increases, uh, better working conditions and things of that sort. And then there are a number of intangible ways in which they can do that, which include things like giving praise, recognition, giving proper feedback, uh, and things like that. Now, that's one of the major areas where most asset management organizations fall down. They have not cracked how best to give praise and recognition when necessary to staff who are engaged in asset management activities. And it's one of those things almost all asset management organizations have to work on. The second major part of the role of the manager here is about demonstrating commitment. And that's both demonstrating commitment to the asset management ideals that you're trying to pursue and demonstrating commitment to staff members. So how you go about supporting people is desperately important there, showing that you take notice of their ideas, that the organization can learn. And most important of all is demonstrating fairness and consistency. And again, one of the biggest complaints that you get in organization is about people about managers being inconsistent in the way in which they deal with people. So that's absolutely crucial. The third way in which managers hugely influence uh, organizational competence is through the quality of the systems that they put in place. So you want processes and procedures that are fit for purpose. You want to have really good tailored training and development in place. You want to have a truly effective competence management system and so on. So there are things that need to be right there to make sure that people can actually work in their most effective way. And the last thing I think that managers must pay serious attention to are dealing with the pressures that their staff are likely to be under. Uh, there are one or two major areas where that arises. The most important is about goal conflicts about giving people mixed messages about what you want. So let's say you have a maintenance team and there's no point in saying to them at one moment quality and safety is everything in terms of our maintenance arrangements and then in the next minute saying but you have to get this job done as quickly as you possibly can. Once you start doing that you're going to confuse people again, you're not going to get the performance that you want. Now, there are other aspects of pressure that come into this. Peer pressure is terribly important. Do you understand the ways in which uh, peers are encouraging themselves to behave in ways that you don't really want? So you have to keep an eye on that. Um, and the other thing is about the nature of the allegiances that people have. And it's quite common uh, in the asset management world for companies to be formed out of mergers or acquisitions and things of that sort. And you may well find yourself with multiple cultures within the organization because of having multiple allegiances. And you have to work very hard to try to make that change. So, in conclusion, uh, my position about this is that organizational competence is a, a, an aggregate of a set of factors that you have to take into account. It is absolutely true that individual competence is important but individual competence is important within the context of having an overall concept of what 
the whole set of competences are that your organization required. And then, once you have individually competent people, you have to think about how you're supporting them, how you're managing them, how you're working with them to make sure that the structures are appropriate so that they can actually give of their best, that leaders are being clear about what they want and that they carry their staff with them, that the culture of the organization is appropriate to the goals that you want to achieve, and that managers themselves are very closely linked into the various mechanisms and levers that they can use to get the behavior that they want. Thank you.